Well, good evening. It is good to see all of you here tonight. I would encourage you to stand with us on these first couple of songs as we worship. And I know I'm not going to be able to get all of you down close, even though we got room. But I challenge you to sit by someone you don't normally sit by. Even if it's just switching with the person next to you, going a row over. Just kind of, you know, change it up a little. Meet someone new. Spend some time worshiping. Let's stand together. That way you can move about a little bit more. And make a friend as we worship tonight. Sing to the King. Strong. 
Now, before you sit down, I know a couple of you came in afterwards. We're trying something new. We're sitting by someone we don't normally sit by tonight, all right? So if you haven't gotten to that position, get moved while the kids come down for a sermon in a sack. sermon in the sack tonight and it just might have something to do with our theme up there on stage but we'll find out so you pull out something out of your sack we've got what is this a bunny, a bunny. all right anybody have that idea in the bible about bunnies what do you think benson jesus loves bunnies doesn't he okay amy Adam and Eve. There were lots of animals in the garden. Nope. All right. Give us another clue. Okay. Monkey. I wasn't quite sure. That's a really cool, colorful monkey. It definitely fit in our weird animals theme. You got it for Christmas? Okay. So we got a, <laughs> got a monkey and a bunny rabbit. Anybody else have an idea? I bet Pastor Nathan, Nathan has an idea. He's thinking. I don't know. What do you think? Aiden, do you have an idea? Nope. No ideas. Okay. Give us another clue. Our axolotl that we made this week. So I'm going to assume it's supposed to be a fish, right? Or an axolotl, I guess. All right. Any, anybody, you have an idea? No in the ark? All right, awesome. Okay, do you have anything else in your sack? And then I'll have you help me tell the story. We've got more. We've got the whole zoo up here. <laughs> and just in case you didn't guess, there's our hint right there. See our little ark? moms and dads they can see too pretty cool all right and that goes right along with our weird animals theme because there are a lot of weird animals aren't there i mean look at this bunny rabbit its ears are as big as his whole body almost and then you got the funny colored monkey the axolotl remember we learned about that one this week at vbs all right so tell us a little bit about the story kayla god told uh, noah to build a boat because there is going to be a big flood and, and it Rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long time. Have you guys ever seen it rain that long? We had a year that it rained, felt like that long, but it wasn't 40 days and 40 nights, was it? Okay, and then what happened when it rained that long? God, or um, Noah sent, the next morning, Noah sent a, a dove to um, go out, and he, and it found a, a leaf. Okay, and then... So when, when it destroyed, with, with that much rain, it kind of pretty much destroyed everything, didn't it? All the animals, all the, all the land, every, all the trees, everything out there when it rains for that long. And the whole earth was covered, right? And so then he sent out a, a dove, and then what else happened? When he sent out the dove, um, the dove found a leaf. And the first day he didn't find anything, but the next day he found the leaf. Okay, and that told Noah that it was starting to have some vegetation growing, right? And it was about time to come out of the ark. And when Noah and his family came out of the ark, what was the first thing that they did? Do you remember? Did they, did they pray and worship God? Yeah. And they looked up in the sky. What kind of a promise did God give in the sky? A rainbow. Right. And do you remember what that, what that promise was? I'm asking you hard questions. Does that one of my quizzers remember what the promise is about the rainbow, Austin? Never flood the entire earth again. And we'll have floods in parts of the world, but we never have the flood over the entire earth again. Well, boys and girls, here at Weird Animals, we learned a lot about lots of God's different creations and the animals he made. And sometimes we, don't, we look at them and we're like, why do they have such a long neck like a giraffe? And why do you think a giraffe would have a long neck? What do you think? Right, to reach leaves up in the trees. And another animal might stay under the sea and... and it would eat its food down there. But God created all these different animals, and they have different things that they eat and different jobs and responsibilities like earthworms. Do you know what earthworms do? Okay, right. So we even need worms in our ground, don't we? 
So God created every single animal from a little bitty worm to a big giraffe to have a purpose in his world. And God's created each of us to have a special purpose too. Do you remember what our five things we learned in VBS? That God, how God loves us. God loves us even when, even when we're different. God loves us even when we're afraid. God loves us even when we do wrong, when we don't understand. And God loves us when we feel left out, right? So just like these animals are kind of different, unique, and special, and God cared enough about them to put some of them on the ark so they'd be saved. But he loves us even more, doesn't he? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for each one of the boys and girls here today, and thank you for loving them and coming to earth as a sacrifice to pay for our sins and wrong things. And Lord, as we've learned this week in VBS, how much you love us through those different hard times we go through and through the good times. I pray that you help us to develop a closer friendship with you. And now I'm going to ask the boys and girls to pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us from your word through the story of Noah and all of his weird animals. Help us, Lord, to take care of the world and the animals on it that you've entrusted to us. In Jesus' name, amen. As the uh, praise team comes, I'm going to let them uh, take the lead on these next couple of songs uh, so I can focus all my energy on hitting mostly right notes over here. But as uh, part of my uh, anti-halitosis initiative, I will uh, throw a mint at the first person that can tell me what number he ransomed me is in the hymnal. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no guessing. Or you can guess, but that's going to be hard. There's like 700 numbers. He ransomed me. Three twenty-two? I don't think that's right. <laughs> Keep guessing. <laughs> three fifty-three. Was that June? Oh, hey. I don't know if I can throw that far. Oh my goodness! That was the scatter approach. <laughs> Don't tell Terry. I can only. <laughs> I, oh, no. He's probably watching right now. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number 353. Is that right? 353. He ransomed me, and then we're going to go right on to 354. Yeah. All because of God's amazing grace. Sin and 
and sadness to the heights of joy and gladness Jesus lifted me in mercy full and free with his precious blood he bought me when I knew him not he sought me and in love divine he ransomed me hallelujah what a savior who can take a poor lost sinner lift him from the miry clay and set him free Glory, shouting, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Jesus ransomed me. By and by, with joy increasing and with gratitude unceasing, lifted up with Christ forevermore to me. I will join the host there singing in the anthem.
you, Roger, and Stephen, and everyone else. You did great. Well, it's a good thing that it's, you know, just us here tonight, and we can be a family together. And I hope that in the midst of our time spent together, that we truly grow in that way. And uh, I know that that means if you spend any time with your family, that sometimes we get on each other's nerves. Sometimes we rub each other the wrong way. But in the end, we are family and, and we are together. And uh, there's something more important than, than the silly little issues that we faced yesterday. And so as we move forward together, um, let's just keep that in mind. And uh, I, I'm glad that those of you who, who feel able uh, can joke together. And uh, I love to hear us laughing in, in the foyer and, and even in the sanctuary. And the last thing that I want is, is my son to grow up thinking that church is, is terrible and awful and boring, and someplace that, that well, they don't want to be because um, it shouldn't be that way. And so, I don't know, just a word of encouragement tonight for us in, in that um, this is a place that we should smile a lot, and uh, it's okay to laugh. But, uh, yes, Sherry, you have something to share. Cool. What's his name? Cameron. Sherry Ray's 14-year-old grandson is uh, in a, going as an ambassador. Is that what you just said? And then as an ambassador student for uh, the U.S. and will be traveling to three different countries and learning the systems and relations there. So he'll be gone 19 days. Um, so she would like us to pray for Cameron as he travels. Uh, on that note, are, are there anything, any other prayer needs that we can lift up with one another? You just want to make us aware. Mission trip, what's that? You are. Good. Oh, that's that's tomorrow. Okay, we should probably go pack. So everyone's dismissed, and um, <laughs> no, we we leave uh, tomorrow. Yes, the teens, fourteen of us, um, or I'm sorry, eighteen of us, fourteen teens and and four adults to Beaumont, Texas, and we will spend a week being an extension and an illuminator for North Point Community Church. That is a recent church plant there. And uh, we just want to enhance what they're doing and be an asset to them in their community and in the context that they are already doing ministry and the work of God. So three of, nope, five, six, because Victoria's here too. So we got six of our crew here tonight. That's pretty good. Yeah, Hi. Lucas is going all the way to Budapest to find a girlfriend. What did you say? To study abroad. Okay. Uh, Lucas is, is traveling for, how long has he gone? 25 days. And he's going to be, uh, he gets credit, college credit for this. And uh, this will be a, a neat experience. But he leaves tomorrow.
Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, and uh, then the ushers will receive the evening tithes and offerings. Thank you, God, for that it's Father's Day, and help the teens and everybody in the hospital. Amen. Manly man, what exactly are we talking about? Manly is a classic term of approval, suggested traits admired by society, such as determination, decisiveness, courage, and strength. Popular culture associates manliness with things like hot rods, steak, football, and chest hair, while conversely prohibiting things like hand lotion, tanning beds, minivans, and aerobics. Well, I contend that real men, manly men, live boldly, speak truthfully, and lead reliably. And for those who don't, well, you know what time it is. It's time to man up. And only youth pastors and worship arts pastors can get away with some of the things that Brett and Nathan get away with. But we're glad they're around, aren't, aren't you? Yeah. I, and I want to commend you for being here tonight. Uh, there's a hundred other places you could be. Uh, one of them could be um, at home uh, in the air conditioning in front of uh, a television or, or some other mode of, of communication. And we're glad that you're here. I know that this week was a busy week around the church with Vacation Bible School. A lot of energy and um, effort was put into the week of uh, Vacation Bible School, and then today's Father's Day. Um, how many of you had an opportunity uh, to go out for lunch? Any guys went out for lunch? Yeah, my kids took me out to, to lunch and enjoyed time with them, and I'm sure that you had opportunity this afternoon to spend time with those that you care about. You know, over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of discussion in a lot of different arenas of life about what is a man. And um, if, you are, if you're into Esquire magazine, and I'm not, but I understand that every year Esquire magazine has an issue devoted to the question, what is a man? And there's all kinds of answers and responses that come out of the research of that particular annual issue. Uh, quite frankly, the theme of Vacation Bible School uh, probably dovetails with what some people think about men. They're kind of weird animals. Uh, some people demonize men, and other people almost deify men. And somewhere in between, I think, is the real answer to what is a man. And, and I think for our purposes tonight, it's important for us to discover what the Creator um, says about humankind and specifically on this Father's Day about what he says uh, about men. Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 that God created us in his image and in his likeness. He, in, he implanted, he imprinted something of himself in us. Genesis chapter 2 verse uh, 7 says that God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living creature or a living being. One translation says he became a soul. That's what God thinks about us. It's because that's how God created us. And if we don't understand what the expectations are for us, then we'll have a difficult time understanding exactly what we're supposed to be and do in um, the culture and world in which we live. So I want to take you to a single verse of scripture tonight. It'll provide kind of a springboard for some thoughts, and then we'll look at a couple of other uh, verses of scripture, and uh, then we'll get home uh, before too long, and you can rest before a new week begins. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 13, I want to read verse 36. And when I 
heard Kim start talking about David this morning, I said, oh no, she, she's stealing um, my message for tonight. But uh, I think it's really confirmation that this is kind of where God wants us to land and what he wants us to look at this evening. This is the singular summation of David's life according to the historian Luke. Luke chapter 13 verse 36 says, For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. There's a lot of people who fall asleep in church, but this is not the same kind of fell asleep. Okay? In other words, he died and was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. David served God's purpose in his generation. And I want us to think about our generation as our family. Because I think our generation includes our family. And I want to direct a lot of my thoughts tonight to men, okay? The rest of you can listen in, take notes. And um, if you're married to a man, I'd encourage you maybe um, to share some of these thoughts throughout the next week and um, maybe you can um, improve uh, some areas in the life of the man that you love and care about. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. The Bible says that God looks to and fro across the earth looking for someone whose heart is fully devoted to him. I want to be that kind of man. I want to be the kind of man who has a heart after God's own heart. And I want to be a man whose heart is fully devoted to God. The Bible says that David was that kind of man. And I think if we're going to be men after God's own heart, that we can learn something from the life of David that can be applied to who we are and what we're called to be. Three things about David that we know. He was a king. He was a shepherd. He was a warrior. He was a king. He was a shepherd. He was a warrior. If we're going to man up and not give up, when the challenges of life come, it's sometimes easy for us to give up, just to abdicate the responsibility and role that we have as men. But if we're going to man up, then we're going to have to be kings. Now I can imagine the picture that's going through your mind. Yeah, I'm king of my castle. And my throne's my lazy boy. And my scepter is the remote control. And my footstool is the coffee table. And my servants is my wife and my kids. That's not what it means to be a king. In fact, we get into trouble when we think that way. A king really is called to lead and to guide a group of people. And there's a world of difference in being a leader and lording authority over people. David, when he was at his best, was leading and guiding the nation of Israel. And the scripture says that David served God's purpose as king in his generation. That word served that's found there in that 36th verse of the 13th chapter of the book of Acts is a word that's only used a handful of times in the New Testament. It literally means under rower. Back in um, Bible times, these big, huge ships had um, a lower level, the hull of the ship. And slaves would take oars and they would row, row, row the boat through not so gently seas. And they would exert a great deal of effort and energy and manpower to get that ship to where it needed to go safely into the harbor with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. 
And I want to suggest to us tonight, men, that if we're going to lead our family the way that God wants us to lead them, we're going to have to be under rowers. We're going to have to get in the hall of the ship called family and marriage. And we're going to have to exert some energy and some effort and some focus and some purpose in leading and guiding our families so that they can make it safely to the harbor. David served God's purpose in his generation. Now let's be a little interactive tonight. I want someone to find 2 Samuel chapter 23 verses 3 and 4. 2 Samuel's in the Old Testament. It's kind of in the first third of the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 3 and 4. All right. Jermaine. Jermaine, yeah. Verse uh, 3 and 4. Correct. Okay. Now, now these are some of David's last words. I probably should have set that up. These are some of the last words that David ever spoke. They were recorded for us in Holy Scripture. And David is saying that when a person rules in righteousness, they become like the dew in the morning. And it allows the grass to grow. A king who leads and guides is someone who brings righteousness and peace to their reign, to their realm of responsibility as men. Men who have a desire to lead from the heart, a heart like God's, will lead their family in righteousness and peace. And they'll be spoken well of in their generation. So first of all, men after God's own heart are called to be kings and when, when King Jesus is Lord of our lives, there will be something about the character and the person of Jesus that will be demonstrated through the way we live our lives. Second thing about David and about any man that wants to have a heart like God, there'll be a shepherd. A shepherd is someone who protects, provides for their sheep, for their flock. Now, I was raised in that generation. My, my dad taught me to work hard. He instilled in me a, a strong work ethic. And he provided well for us. We always had a roof over our head. We always had clothes on our back. We always had food on the table. He provided very well for us. He was a good shepherd of his flock. Can I tell you that it's more than just providing the necessities of life? Because quite frankly, any man can provide for the necessities of life. But it takes a godly man to lead his family and to provide for his family and to protect his family in a godly way right. that leads them to the cross and brings them to the feet of Jesus. And quite frankly, that's the responsibility that we have as parents. I'm glad to be a part of a church that, that believes in the value of children and youth. And we pour a lot of effort and a lot of resources into our children and our youth, and well, we should. But can I tell you that the, the primary responsibility for the training and the nurturing of our children and our youth is not on the church. The church stands beside parents to try and resource them and tool them and encourage them. But as parents, 
and particularly tonight as men, we have a primary responsibility to be the leaders, the spiritual leaders, the godly men in our homes that help point our kids to Christ. We're to lead lovingly and we're to purposely point our kids to Jesus Christ. We're to be the disciple makers in our home. We're to be the priests over our families. And one of the things that we see about David was that he understood that. Now, he, he didn't always do a good job of it, but he understood that that was his responsibility. Somebody find uh, Psalm 78, verses 70, and 70, 70, 70 through 72. Psalm 78. Verses 70 through 72. Okay? All right, thank you. He shepherded them with integrity of heart. That's character. And with skillful hands, he led them. That's competence. As men, we need character. And we need competence. Say, where do you get character and competence? You get character from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you get competence by learning how to listen and to lean and to obey the voice of God in your life. The Bible says if any man... And I think woman, um, it applies to women as well. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally and does not withhold. I don't know about you, but across the years, I've needed a lot of wisdom in knowing how to raise our children. And even though they're now... Raised, there's still a lot of wisdom that I need in knowing how to relate to them as adults and try to still exercise some measure of influence over them in these days. I want to be a good shepherd of the flock that God has given to me. First pastorate, for us was in Drumright, Oklahoma, a little northeast Oklahoma town of 3,200. Um, we had two of our children um, at that time, and I came out of seminary wanting to win the world. Um, I had the mistaken idea that God called me to walk on water and to be the Messiah and save the world. And I invested a great deal of time and, and effort and, and a lot of myself in trying to win that community for Christ and for the kingdom. Trying to establish my own sense of pastoral identity. And in the process, I missed out on some of the formative years of my two boys' life. And I finally came to the realization that if I won the world, but I lost my kids, my family, what good would it be? We can sometimes buy into what the culture says about what men should be and what men should do. And there's nothing wrong. I told you, my dad instilled in us a strong work ethic, and there's nothing wrong with hard work. 
but we can work hard and do all the right things and try to get the corner office and climb the, the, the ladder of success and come to the realization after a number of years that the ladder is leaning against the wrong building and end up losing our families. David experienced some of that. Read the story of David. He didn't always make the right decisions. In many ways, as a father, he was a failure. But he also understood forgiveness. And after David sinned with Bathsheba and lost a child and, and ultimately lost a, another son, Absalom, he finally came to the realization that if he wasn't right with God, he could never shepherd, he could never lead, never guide his family. And I guess my appeal to us tonight as men is let's not lose sight of the fact that God has called us to shepherd our own flock. And that starts at home. It starts with our family. David was a king. He was a shepherd. Thirdly, he was a warrior. You know, the greatest battle David ever won was the first battle that he ever fought. Any of you children know what the first battle David fought? Brooklyn? With Goliath, exactly. Huge battle. And yet he went, he went to war. He stood in the gap when nobody else would. That's the kind of man I want to be. That I'll step up instead of stand down. That, that, I'll, be, that I'll man up and not give up. When God counts on me to do battle for the things that matter most in life. And I think all of our battles are different. But God calls us to be warriors. God calls us to stand in the gap for our families. To pray for them. To lead them. To teach them. The Bible says that the that the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible also says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I like what Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24. He came to a decisive moment in his life and brought the nation of Israel to a decisive moment in their history. And David said... I mean, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Can't decide for the whole world, but we can make a decision about what we're going to do in our home. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what I want to challenge you with, men. I want to challenge you to be a warrior. And to make a declaration, one of our churches, a precious lady by the name of Georgia May, would stand and testify quite often. She'd say, I want three worlds to know. That world, this world, and that world. I want three worlds to know where I stand. Maybe it would be a good thing for us to say, I want three worlds to know that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. David served God's purpose in his generation. And he fell asleep. He died. Now, I got no way of proving this, but I think he died and he woke to the well done of God. 
this what I'd like for my own life? I'd like to fall asleep and wake up in the eternal presence of my God and Savior Me too. and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Men, it's time to man up. I mean, the world's no friend of faith. And unless you've been in a cave somewhere or asleep under a rock, um, you, you probably realize that um, there, there's, there's a lot of attacks on the family. And God needs for some of us to man up. Truth is, he needs for all of us to man up. Say, I'm going to be the king who leads with integrity, who lives boldly, who acts decisively, whatever that third one was in that video. But that's what we're going to do. And we're going to be king and shepherd and warrior for our family. So let's man up. And as we man up, let's stand up and we'll have a closing word of prayer. Father, I thought this morning about the incredible impact and the tremendous difference that the men who were here this morning could make, not just in the life of this faith community, but the difference that the men could make in the world where you've placed them. If we'd all commit to manning up. Father, far too often we're challenged to a point where instead of manning up, we give up. Maybe from discouragement. Maybe from a sense of despair. But God, I pray for these men who are here tonight that they would determine in in their hearts that they're going to serve your purpose in this generation. They're going to serve that purpose as the king and the shepherd and the warrior as they commit themselves to being men after your own heart. Make it so, I pray for me, And make it so in the hearts and lives of each of these men. I thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you're up to in these days. May we get in the flow of what your spirit is doing. And may we discover that these can be some of the greatest days we've ever known. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a good week.
Okay, sing this with me now. 